how will it protect taxpayer dollars if the taxpayers are making less? That doesn't make sense. All right? It's not going to protect them. And this shows that you only have a regard for for taxpayers if they are the owners of the means of production. You don't care about the workers who pay taxes. So if you actually cared about the workers who pay taxes, and don't give me that bullshit about, well, if the business owners don't have to pay as many taxes, they're going to pass that on to the workers. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. That's the way capitalism works. It doesn't work that way. Because if they save more on their taxes, where does that money go? It doesn't go into the workers' hands. Stop taking, stop putting on this benevolent, uh, this benevolent facade of business owners in your head and thinking that's how it works in real life. No. If a business owner is able to pocket the money, then that's what they're going to do. They're not going to be so benevolent that, oh, I'm saving more money by not paying as many taxes. Let me pass this on to my workers. Wrong. It does not happen that way. They pocket the money. I'm telling you right now. Look, let me. What, what's the temperature? It's 77 right now. 77 on March 12th. I'm already hot. Look, see that? You see that? You see that? Look, it's hot. And if you're a worker, oh, they got you effed all the way up. They got you effed all the way up. Because the thing is that these Florida politicians do not give a damn about you, me, or anybody else. There's times like this where I wish I had some liquor in this because. Baby, let me tell you, this is where Florida got all of us effed up. I'm telling you right now, these Florida people, let me share. Take a look. This is out of Orlando Weekly. Came out yesterday. Florida legislator approves bill blocking local workplace heat protection standards. I'm going to tell you something right now. As somebody that's lived in Florida for a, as long as I have, It's hot. These, these curtains aren't enough. I need some blackout curtains. Do you know how hot it gets here with humidity? And you mean to tell me that these politicians are weakening heat protection standards for workers, especially workers that work outside? If you work outside in any capacity, this also includes people who work in theme parks too. I'm telling you, you need to band together with your fellow workers and say no. Let's get into the article because it is egregious what they're doing here in this state. It says HB 433 prevents cities and counties from requiring employees, I'm sorry, employers to provide shade and water to outdoor, outdoor workers. So let's get into it. Florida Republican dominated legislator muscled through an industry back bill last week that if approved by Governor Ron DeSantis would block local governments from requiring their contractors to provide heat safety measures such as water breaks and other cooling measures for employees who work outdoors. Hang on. Number one, my opinion, Ron DeSantis is, I'm pretty sure he's going to sign it. He's not going to veto this. He's a corporate stooge. He's a corporate tool. So he's going to approve this. And this is not just to people who work in theme parks. It could people be people who work for 
uh, the city of Orlando, the municipality of Orange County. It could be people who work at the beaches. It could be people who, hell, work at water parks. Like, what in the world? And you mean to tell me that you're not going to, you're going to weaken these standards for workers? Because the industry wants less protections for work? Oh, I forgot. We live in the United States of America. Let's continue. It says, approve on the final day of the state's legislative session. The bill, HB 433, would also gut local living wage ordinances passed in some communities beginning in the fall of 2026 and prevent local governments from enacting predictive scheduling laws, which essentially require employers to notify hourly workers of their work schedules in advance. I want you guys to take a uh, uh, focus on this, this paragraph. Because what this is basically telling us is that living wage ordinances, which may either be as high as the state of Florida or higher than the state of Florida, are now able to bypass these. So if let's say I have a company and I live in Brandon, Florida, right? And the state says I can only pay $12 an hour, but Brandon city government says, well, you have to pay, let's say 14. Our minimum for the city of Brandon is $14 an hour. Let's just say hypothetically, right? I don't have to listen. If I'm a owner, I don't have to listen to the city of Brandon, even though I am operating within the municipality. I can just go by the state. And so I can pay $2 lower per hour because that's the state standard. Which means that if you're a worker living in Brandon, Florida, and if their minimum wage is $14 an hour, but the employer says, oh, I'm only going to pay $12 an hour because that is the city. I'm sorry, that's the state minimum wage. Well, then that's what they're going to pay. Even though you're within the jurisdiction of the city. So that's what this law is. Now, I also want to direct your attention to something else. It says, beginning in the fall of 2026, what happens in the fall of 2026? That is when Florida achieves $15 an hour minimum wage. Remember, right? Back in 2022, I think it was. We moved, we actually voted for a $15 an hour minimum wage by citizen ballot initiative. It was not through the via of the governor. It was not through the Florida legislator. It was through citizen ballot initiative, meaning the people in a red state, mind you, the people said, we want a living wage. And now they're saying, ah, nah, 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 we got to weaken this. Y'all can't get no damn living wage. We don't want you to give a living wage. This is what happens when politicians work against the people. This is why I say leave both parties. Because the Florida Democrats are terrible. They're trash. And we already know that the Florida Republicans who run this state, I'm trying to watch my language, but you know what I want to say. So leave both parties because they are trash. You want to go third party? I right, go third party. Or if you want to go independent, I right, go independent. But focus on those ballot initiatives because those ballot initiatives actually made it so that we can get $15 an hour. And it says, and prevent local governments from enacting predictive scheduling laws, which essentially require employers to notify hourly workers of their work schedules in advance. Do you know what this means? This means that let's say you're, I'm your employer or I'm your manager and you have a schedule from Sunday to Saturday and you have your work schedule, right? Let's say Saturday evening, the schedule changes. Your schedule changes. According to this law, I don't have to notify you. 
That means that you have to constantly check in to see if the schedule changes. Meaning, let's say you had a day off before, before I posted a new schedule. I don't have to notify you. I don't have to do it in advance. I can do it morning off. They don't care about workers. Let's continue. So the predictive scheduling ban was a last minute edit to the legislation, which previously would have prevented local governments from enacting any regulation of terms and conditions of employment. The legislation sponsored by first term Republican Tiffany Esposito was opposed by most Democrats and a smattering of Republican legislators in swing districts, districts but backed by deep pocketed business lobby. This is the point. If you think that the Republicans care about workers, you got another thing coming. Don't get it twisted. Democrats will say that they care. <laughs> but no, Republicans are telling you that they don't care about workers. Not in this state. And it's all about the job creators. Can't have job creators without no workers, though. It continues. Records obtained by investigative newsletters seeking rents shows the legislative legislation was at least in part drafted by lobbyists for the business-friendly Florida Chamber of Commerce, which has historically campaigned against minimum wage increases and has sought a ban on living wage ordinances for years. Esposito herself is the president of the Regional Chamber of Con Commerce in Bonilla Springs and was sponsored similarly preemptive legislation targeting local communities' tenant rights laws last year. So she's a corporate stooge. So the ban on local living wage ordinances has been years in the making. These are essentially local laws passed by some city or county governments that require the employers to contract with to pay minimum wage that's higher than the state minimum wage of $12 an hour. So just to let you guys know, Back in September of 2023, we had just increased the minimum wage to $12 an hour. So every September, the minimum wage will increase until 2026 when we reach $15 an hour. And then once we hit $15 an hour in 2026, then the minimum wage will increase in accordance with inflation. And they don't want that because they want more money. And by they, I mean the corporations. And so they're trying to circumvent this, circumvent the will of people through the Florida legislature. This is why, and I'll say it time and time again, that in order to truly combat them, means of direct democracy like ballot initiatives are so important because you don't go through a politician. You direct the law itself. Don't depend on these politicians. They're not here for you. They're gonna screw you at least the ones in the duopoly so far, one I can tell. All right, let's continue. So here's the fact, Florida's minimum wage is already set to rise $1 each year until it reaches $15 an hour on September 20th of 2026. Due to a constitutional amendment Florida voters approved in 2020, despite an opposition campaign spearheaded by the Florida Chamber of Commerce, right? Under the bill approved Friday, thousands of employees and communities with such ordinances in place could see their wages change come October 2026. The bill would not affect employees of the city or county governments, however, which would maintain the right to regulate wages of their own employees. 
so that's the that's uh it's so egregious it's crazy it is unclear how many contracted workers will be affected and Esposito couldn't say for sure for herself but in miami Dade, it is expected to affect more than twenty eight thousand employees from airport baggage handlers to custodians and healthcare professionals so who is this going to hurt primarily the essential workers the people who we depend on day in and day out for our goods and services that is who is going to affect if you're a, a professional if you're in a professional managerial class let's say you're making 80 90 thousand dollars a year is it really going to affect you no it's not really going to affect you but what kind of solidarity do you have with your workers who are in these positions, who are in these entry-level jobs? Do you have solidarity with them? It says Esposito, who argued the bill will protect taxpayer dollars refused to answer whether workers could see pay cuts if the bill signed into law could wages go down maybe she admitted during the bill's first hearings up to the prerogative of the employer here's here's the thing miss esposito i gotta tell you something how will it protect taxpayer dollars if the taxpayers are making less That doesn't make sense. All right? It's not going to protect them. And this shows that you only have a regard for, for taxpayers if they are the owners of the means of production. You don't care about the workers who pay taxes. So if you actually cared about the workers who pay taxes, and don't give me that bullshit about, well, if the business owners don't have to pay as many taxes, they're going to pass that on to the workers. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. That's the way capitalism works. It doesn't work that way. Because if they save more on their taxes, where does that money go? It doesn't go into the workers' hands. Stop taking, stop putting on this benevolent uh this benevolent facade of business owners in your head and thinking that's how it works in real life no if a business owner is able to pocket the money then that's what they're going to do they're not going to be so benevolent that oh i'm saving more money by not paying as many taxes let me pass this on to my workers wrong it does not happen that way they pocket the money what do they do it's about cutting costs, cutting costs so that the profits will go up. That's how it works. And she knows this, you know this, and I know this. And by that very metric alone, she is lying to you. She is lying to the voters. She is lying to the taxpayers. That's what she's doing because that's her job because she is a corporate stooge. And what corporate stooges do is that they will lie to your face and tell you this is to protect you when in reality it's never to protect you. It's actually to protect the business owners, the people who own the means of production, because guess what? They want the riches for themselves. That's what this is about. It's never about protecting you and me. This is why, this is why citizen ballot initiatives to circumvent these try not to cuss these ignoramuses in tallahassee i'm telling you right now they will put you back in chains look they will put those of us who are black people back in chains and then they will put you white people in chains if they can, that's how they operate. Because whether it's the Republicans or their co-workers under the corporate masters, the Democrats, that's how it's gonna happen. They're gonna put all of us back. 
They're setting us. They're setting us all the way back to chattel slavery at this point. Do I sound hyperbolic? Go ahead, let me know. But it's not because every single time you peel back a worker protection, you're going back to slave. Slavery is here, right? During the New Deal, we, you know, we as as things progressed during the New Deal, we went this far. Post New Deal, then they started going back and back and back and back and back. So guess what? All right? Or let me do it like this: slavery, New Deal. Since then, the business owners were like, "Oh hell no, we want," and it goes back and back and back and back and back. They're trying to get as much free labor as out of you as possible. I don't care what anybody says. They want that free labor. They're not so benevolent that, oh, well, we just want to pay good workers for good work. No, you want that shit for free. You want to talk about lazy people who sit on their ass all day and expect everything handed to them? It's not socialists. It's not communists. It's capitalists. They're the ones that want everything for free. Because they don't actually want to do the work themselves. That's your enemy. Anywho, let's continue. The ban on workplace heat safety standards, which gained national attention after a summer of record-breaking heat, appeared to be largely targeting a proposed ordinance in Miami-Dade County where county commissioners last fall considered adopting landmark standards for heat exposure that would have been much stronger than what is already required under state and federal law, which isn't much. No other community in Florida has passed any local ordinances mandating such a thing. This bill would prevent local communities from trying. So let's say uh, let's say the city of Orlando, where I live, let's say they say, okay, if you're working, if you're working uh, an eight hour workday, and let's say the temperatures are above 82 degrees, right? You are allowed instead of two 15 minute breaks and a 30 minute break. If you're working outside, let's say you're allowed six 15 minute breaks and a half hour break. And those 15 minute breaks, you still get paid for, right? Meaning that if you're taking those breaks, especially out of the sun, that's money that's not being made by the capitalist. And because of that, then guess what? They're not making as much profit because you're taking a break because you don't want to get heat stroke. And if that happens in a place like Orlando, if the city says, look, this is our standards and it's above the standards of the state, they don't want that. It's a, if it's above the standards. In the city of Orlando and in the municipality of Orange County, that's Disney, baby. That's Universal Orlando. That's some of the biggest employers in the state. Orange County is one of the most populous counties in the state. Outside of Tampa, Jacksonville and Miami, Orlando is one of the most populous states. I'm sorry, cities. So yeah, of course they don't want that. Plus Orlando is a, dem a Democrat controlled city. It says state legislation approved last week was strongly opposed by organized labor movement which has fought similar preemption attempts in the past in addition to immigrant rights groups and other workers' rights organizations. So 
So, it says currently, employers that fail to provide heat safe workplace in Florida can face a potential fine from OSHA, that's Occupational Safety and Health Administration, under the agency's general duty clause, but fewer do. Florida Republicans, regardless, pointed to OSHA's voluntary guidelines and the risk of being fined for failing to protect workers on the job as the defense of the preemptive legislation, which remained divisive to the end. The preemption on wage and scheduling policies in Florida's bill, in particular, almost died in the Florida Senate, which didn't get on board with the portion of the bill until the second to last day of session. That's when Esposito agreed to delay the implementation to date of September 30th of 2026. So, and now the bill is headed to DeSantis for his signature. But make no mistake, this does not reach uh, its enactment or it, it, you know, follow through until September of 2026. So workers are gonna get hit blindsided by this because they're not gonna realize this happens until by the time we hit October. But then by that time, if you're working outside, it's cooling down. It's not that bad, but it's in 2027, that next time where we hit, it's not even when we hit summer, it's when we hit spring because it gets that hot here. When we hit spring, and we start having more record temperatures than what we do now, mark my words, it will happen. Guess what's gonna happen? They're gonna be like, well, I need to take a break. And the workers, I'm sorry, the employers are gonna be like, ah no, no. Because the city, the city won't allow for that to happen. I'm sorry, they won't allow the cities to happen, to do that. So let me share something with you guys real quick. This is from the Scientific American. It says, what's causing this record-breaking heat? This is from last year says, yet another heat dome will send temperatures skyrocketing across the U.S. And southwest just after the planet saw its hottest week on record. It says temperatures are set to skyrocket to potentially record-setting levels across the U.S. Southwest. Yet another heat dome entrenches itself over the southern tier of the country in Mexico. Just It is just one of many pushing deadly heat waves that have big locations around the world from China to Algeria this spring and summer. The trend towards moving frequent, longer lasting and more intense heat waves is a hallmark of climate emergency that has resulted from humans burning fossil fuels and releasing planet warming greenhouse gases. What do they say? More frequent, longer lasting and intense heat waves. So the implementation of this law means that they say that we don't care if the heat waves are going to be more intense, longer lasting and frequent. We don't want you guys, we don't want cities to be able to implement more stricter standards for the workers in favor of the workers. That's basically what they're saying. Screw the workers. Let's just help out the people who own the businesses. Jesus. It says the heat extremes along with exceptionally warm, uh, warm ocean waters contribute to the first week of July becoming the hottest week on record globally based on preliminary data. According to the World Meteorological Meteor, oh, gosh, I can't talk today. World Meteorological Organization, that milestone came just after the hottest June on record, with an El Nino event in place that is set to further boost global temperatures. Experts expect more monthly and potentially even deadly heat records to be 
topped. The last heat wave is courtesy of an intensifying high pressure system over the Southwest, which is affecting broad swath of the Southern third of the country, which systems feature sinking air, which gets compressed and heats up. The accompanying clear skies also allow plenty of sunlight to stream to Earth's surface, furthering rising temperatures. Through the South, though the Southwest is synonymous with summer heat, this event will be notable for both its magnitude and its longevity. Phoenix, Arizona has already seen 11 consecutive days with high temperatures above 110 degrees Fahrenheit, which is about five degrees Fahrenheit above the average for the area at this time of year. That is the fourth longest period of such days in this city's history. And if it continues, could set a record long streak. So what we're seeing now is a potential for more people to die at work. It says a new study in Nature Medicine found that more than 60,000 people died from heat related causes during blistering heat waves in Europe. Europe. If they're dying in Europe from heat related illnesses, what makes you think they're not going to be dying here? Hmm? It says that toll suggests that the heat adaptation plans that cities and counties, I'm sorry, countries have put in place, such as early warning systems, are insufficient to protect vulnerable populations. And the findings come as around an area as areas around Europe, particularly Italy, Spain, and Portugal, face brutal heat again this summer. North Africa, too, has seen astounding heat. On July 6th, the temperature in Adarar, Algeria didn't drop below 103 degrees, even at night, the Associated Press reported. High nighttime temperatures add to the danger of heat waves because the body doesn't get a chance to cool off and recover. So, with the onset of climate change and global warming happening. Really, it is a, it is an imperative for us to fight against these capitalists who want you to continuously work outside with less breaks, and some people will say, what well, they just don't want it to be dictated by the cities. What's wrong with it being dictated by the cities? If the cities dictate, oh, it's because of the ones that are run by Democrats, right? Make no mistake, I don't have any love for Democrats. But it's ultimately really just about going against the workers because the workers do not want to work if they're about to suffer from heat stroke. I'm going to share this video really quick. It's not very long, but I think it's this is from the U.S. Department of Labor. I think it's okay for me to share that. Yep, the Department of Labor actually has a YouTube a YouTube channel. All right, let's take a look. Every year, thousands of workers become sick from heat exposure, and some cases are fatal. Dangerous heat exposure can occur indoors or outdoors in any season. Nearly three out of four heat illness fatalities happen during the first week of work. So new and returning workers need to build tolerance to heat by taking frequent breaks and working shorter shifts to start. It is also important to drink water, even if you aren't thirsty. Take rest breaks to recover from heat in the shade or a cool area. Be sure to wear a hat and light color, loose fitting, breathable clothing if possible. And remember to monitor yourself and fellow workers for signs of heat illness. 
Also, if you're wearing a face covering or personal protective equipment such as a respirator, verbally check on others frequently for signs of heat illness. To learn more about heat illness prevention and first aid, visit osha.gov slash heat. So, let's go over the facts. This is from the government. Every year, thousands of workers become sick from heat exposure and some cases are fatal. Dangerous heat exposure can occur indoors or outdoors in any season. Those of you who worked in the kitchen, like myself, I actually went to culinary school and I worked in the industry for a few years before I got sick. It's about a good 95 to 100 degrees in the kitchen. We're told to drink plenty of water. And we're told to take our breaks. And we're inside in the kitchen. It could be freezing cold outside, but it gets hot. So if you're working and it's a high humidity, which it always is here in Florida, and then on top of that, you're out in the sweltering sun, let's say you're working in the, let's say you're, you're doing roofing work, right or you could be a rod operator at let's say bush gardens but let's say tampa goes well we have these particular ordinances that workers can only work so long in this heat they have to be able to take breaks at you know these you know these amounts of times and water breaks and whatnot but tampa can no longer go above what the state or state ordinance is all because the companies don't want you to take more breaks than what the state says they don't want more protections for workers now the city can go below that they, they're cool with that but going above it for protection of workers no nah, they don't they don't like that nearly three out of four heat illness fatalities happen during the first week of work oh baby during the first week of work so if uh you're just starting a job and you haven't worked outside before it's important that you actually take more breaks than usual because you have to get used to being out there. But the corporations, the corporate dictators, didn't want that. They want to get as much out of you as they possibly can. <sighs> it's three out of four. That's 75%, y'all. That's 75%. Dear God. So new and returning workers need to build tolerance to heat by taking frequent breaks and working shorter shifts to start. That's what they don't want to hear. That's what they don't want you to have do. They don't want you to take frequent breaks. They don't want you to work shorter shifts, especially if it's mandated by the city. They want you to go according to the state, and then they're going to push the state to lower the standards as well. It is also important to drink water, even if you aren't thirsty. Take rest breaks to recover from heat in the shade or a cool area. Be sure to wear a hat and light color, loose fitting, breathable clothing if possible. And remember to monitor yourself and fellow workers for signs of heat illness. Also, if you're wearing a face covering or personal protective equipment such as a respirator, verbally check on others frequently for signs of heat illness. To learn more about heat... This is why they don't want these protections in place being set by cities. Because, and also, I want you guys to notice this. 
let's say the standards are more strict in Miami-Dade than they are in Jacksonville. Well, of course, they're more stricter in Miami-Dade versus Jacksonville. Because Miami is at the southern tip of Florida, whereas Jacksonville is right below Georgia. So, of course, the temperatures are going to be different. Of course, they're going to have more stricter standards in Miami than it is in Jacksonville. Because the further south you go, the hotter it gets. The, hot, the closer you get to the equator, the hotter it gets. And yet, oh, well, we just want one blanketed standard for the entire state. The temperatures aren't all the same in Florida. It is different temperatures. The further north you go, the cooler it is. It's the same thing in places like California. Southern California, it could be 100 degrees. You go to Northern California, it could be in the high 80s because it's that far north. Now, of course, Florida's not as big as California. No way. But are they going to have all the same standards? From city to city? No, it's not going to be the exact same. They may have more stricter standards because it gets hotter down there. This is why citizen ballot initiatives are so important. So even if you don't vote for anybody at all, any particular politician, which I completely get, cool, don't, but pay attention to the ballot initiatives. We're going to be having uh, an election on November 5th. Even if you don't, even if you leave all the politicians blank, that's fine. But pay attention to those ballot initiatives. Those ballot initiatives will affect you and your life directly. And also, that is a way of you expressing yourself directly in a democratic way. So direct democracy. Like for instance, the recreational legalization of cannabis is actually on the ballot this November. I'm just saying, that's just one example. We passed the $15 an hour minimum wage in 2022. Why? Because we said yes. We didn't depend on the, on the legislator to, to do it because it would never have happened. So pay attention to that. But yeah, I'm going to tell you right now, these politicians got us effed up all the way up. Thank you so very much for watching my channel. And I deeply appreciate it from the top and bottom of my heart. If you wish to support the channel further so I can keep bringing you content that is educational and informative, you can become a patron on patreon.com forward slash jbfon. You can find that link in the pinned comment or in the description below. No matter what you give, you'll be supporting independent media and education that helps make the world better. Thank you so much. And you can watch more of my content here. Mwah. Forehead kisses and have a beautiful day.